right, good morning, Creekside. How's everyone doing this morning? Good, all right. Hey, the, the first service seemed pretty tired. Are you guys tired this morning? <laughs> all right, well, good. Well, hey, go ahead and stand as we get ready to sing. I'm going to read from Psalm 100 this morning for us. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Has the Lord been good to you this morning? Has the Lord been faithful to you this morning? Amen. Well, let's, let's sing to him. Let's thank him for that this morning. Amen. guys how you doing good i'm glad that we're awake we're ready to go how good it is to worship together seeing of his praise of the good he's done and he has done it and will do it 
and continues to do it day after day. Well, hey, my name is Jake. If I've had the pleasure of meeting you, welcome to Creekside. So glad to be worshiping with you. Uh, we exist to saturate Goose Creek and beyond by giving every man, woman, and child consistent encounters with Jesus. And that's why we do everything that we do. And we would love to connect with you and uh, get you plugged in with the mission and how we do things here and how we seek to see the gospel with every man, woman, and child in Goose Creek and beyond. And so some great ways to get connected here at Creekside is one through our Connect card, and that it will be in the back of the chair in front of you. If this is your first time, we would love to get as much information as you feel comfortable giving us. And you can drop that off in the box in the back, or if you head down the hallway, there is a Connect room called Room 5, and it's just down the hallway to your left. And it'll be a great space just to get some coffee or some, some uh, bread table, stuff, snacks, yes, snacks, lots of snacks, or you can also connect with some people after service. It's a great space for that. Another way to get connected at Creekside is through giving. You can give at creeksidegive.org or online. That is online. Creeksidegive.org is online, in case you know that's how the internet works, or you can give in the box in the back. The brain is just not braining right now, okay? I apologize, y'all. It's okay. Well, hey, something that I do really want to point your attention to, very important to life here as a church, uh, we say that a disciple is someone who abides in the word, and we want to give you the resources to be able to do that. And so we're starting a new series in Galatians uh, in the next couple of minutes, and so we're excited, and we're going to be reading as a church through Galatians and through some other passages in Scripture. And so we have that all laid out for you in our reading guide. And you can grab those, or maybe you were handed one by one of our greeters this morning. But I'd invite you to do that. Now, one announcement for us this morning is tonight, for our students, we are doing a birthday day. And so, yeah. Woo! Woo! So this is super exciting because this is the one-year birthday of Creekside Student Ministries. We've been doing this for a whole year, and God has been faithful and blessed this ministry. It's been so cool to see students follow hard after Christ. And so we want to celebrate that. We want to remember all that God has done. But also we want to celebrate our students and uh, just give them a little gift to celebrate all their birthdays as well. So one fell swoop. It's awesome and easy. And also we get to do it in the style of a one-year-old birthday party. So we're going to do that. It's going to be tons of fun. So if you are a sixth grader through 12th grader, I invite you back here tonight, 6 to 8 p.m. It's going to be tons of fun. Well, we're going to uh, get up, get moving. We're going to have our normal time of greeting, so find someone around you, say hi, check in on them, and then we will be back in just a moment with our vision talk. I'll tell you who I am in just a minute. 
Hey, good morning, everybody. It's so good to be able to uh, come here and gather together and uh, greet one another and see some friendly faces and some new faces. We're so thankful uh, for you guys being here this morning. My name's David Lewis. I'm one of our community group leaders here, and I want to give our vision talk, the why behind the what, about community groups. So uh, when we talked about our vision, and you guys have heard this statement before, uh, we are here to saturate Goose Creek and beyond with the gospel of Jesus. We want to give every man, woman, and child multiple encounters with him as he works through us. And so what, we, uh, what we're trying to do there is we're trying to make disciples who abide in Christ, who gather together, and who engage the lost. And so as we're trying to make disciples, that's a very biblical thing. We take that right out of Matthew 28. We're trying to do what Jesus commanded is to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that he has commanded. And so if we're going to do that, we want to try to follow Jesus's model, right? We want to follow Jesus in everything that we do and in every way. And so the way that we uh, have found to make disciples here is that it's best to make disciples in community. And so we see that in Jesus's ministry. He had the crowds for sure. Uh, he had the crowds, but he also had smaller groups of disciples. We see the 500 disciples called out. We see the 120. We see the 70. We see the 12. And then we see Peter, James, and John being the three guys that he poured into the most. And so it takes a lot of faith to believe that pouring into just a small handful of people and walking with a small handful of people after Jesus is going to make an impact. But that's how Jesus changed the world. He poured into those 12 men, and they went all across the world sharing uh, the good news that he is the king of the whole world. Um, so that is what community groups are for. That's why we do them. We gather together to abide in Christ. We look back at what he's done throughout the week and how it's been hard and, and uh, how he's given us power to obey him. And then we look up to, to Christ. We uh, try to see in his word what he is commanding us and asking us to do. And then we look forward to engage the culture around us and engage the people around us and how we might be a light in this dark world. And so that is what I want to invite you into today. I want to invite you into community groups. We have uh, several folks around the room that are leaders that are willing to talk to you about joining a community group, and we have different times and locations for you to be able to fit that into your schedule. So if you have any questions on that, find somebody with a name tag. I know I don't have mine on, but I told you who I am, so uh, <laughs> should be good there. Um, before we get into the rest of our service, uh, we want to take a minute to acknowledge that there are a lot of crazy things happening. Uh, last night, there was a, an attack that we want to... Uh, um, not just let go. We want to take this opportunity to look to the Lord because he is our hope and our strength. We know that uh, Iran had an attack on Israel, and we know there's been things going back and forth. And so uh, rather than letting that capture too much of our attention, we want to focus on the Lord and what he's doing. So if you guys wouldn't mind just praying with me, um, let's uh, pray together. Holy Father, we know that you are good and you are kind, that your loving kindness goes to the thousand generation, Lord, and your justice and mercy is, is um, tied together. Your justice, the way that you work when, when, when there's sin and these major uh, things happen, Lord, you say is uh, to the third or fourth generation of the repeating problems, but your love and your kindness and your goodness is to the thousandth generation, Lord. So we pray that you would pour out your mercy, that you would pour out that goodness, that your spirit would move in all the folks that are involved in this conflict, Lord, that they would realize that the image of God that is before them is more valuable than um, whatever, whatever differences they have, Lord, that they would look to you, and yet, Lord, that you would maintain your justice, that you would maintain... Um, the way that you see sin, Lord, and we know that the final, ultimate judgment, Lord, is not until Jesus returns. So we, we pray that we would hasten the day, that we would reach those who haven't heard while they still have time, that that would be our focus, Lord, that we wouldn't let fear um, just overtake us or overwhelm us, but we would stay focused on you, your message and your mission, that we might be your messengers um, that would take the good news that Jesus 
Christ is king, Lord, that he is ruler of the whole world. Even though these things are happening, Lord, he is ruling and reigning in the hearts of all those who believe and will have all things placed under his feet. It doesn't matter what country it is. It doesn't matter what people it is. You want each and every one of them to bow the knee and claim you as their Lord. And so we ask that that's how you would work, that you would do those things among these people, even in this difficult time, and that we, uh, your children, would would hear from you and would uh, obey. We ask these things in the name of our precious, eternal, powerful, glorious King Jesus. Amen. Would you stand as we continue to sing?
eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus.
of God I will sing of the goodness of God Amen. You guys can have a seat. you're one of our Voyager kids, you are dismissed. We got to get down with that. <clears throat> Man, I tell you, um, I'm loving doing two services. I just got to say, I'm loving it. Uh, we already were here this morning at 9 a.m., and um, it's interesting to see how people change it up. Some come to the 11 last week. And then they went to the 9 a.m. this morning, and then others of you were at the 9 a.m. service last week, but you're here at the 11 this morning. It's interesting to notice people's habits. Well, uh, anyway, <laughs> if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. And as you're turning this morning, I want to ask you a question. And uh, th this question is going to sort of, um, it's not a happy question that I want to ask you this morning, but I want to ask you. Maybe you thought about it. I just want you to think about this for a moment just to yourself. Um, what kills churches? You ever thought about that? What kills churches? Um, maybe you have heard, uh, but churches all across the Western Hemisphere, churches in America in particular, uh, are struggling. A lot of churches are in decline um, here in the Western Hemisphere. And maybe you know personally of a church or, um, or, or you're here, you've heard about the church that's sort of declining. Maybe you know personally of a church that's declining. Maybe you know of a church that has passed over from declining and has even gone to the point of closing its doors for good. And I want to just address some of this this morning. What happens for churches to get to that point where they cease to exist and where they close their doors for good. I want to advocate to you this morning that there are two reasons, there are two things that would cause a church to die. There are two things that would kill a church and two things that we're seeing all the time. These things are infiltrating churches and these things are happening to the point of where churches have to close their doors for good. The first is this. One reason that a church might die is because they have changed the message. You with me this morning? One of the reasons that a church might die or has died in the past is because they have changed the message. I don't know if you're aware, but this is happening all across the Western Hemisphere where the message of the gospel is seen as no longer being sufficient to get people to come to church, to believe in anymore. And so what's happening is the message of the Bible and the gospel is being adulterated and twisted in order to be so-called relevant. Many churches are doing this today where it's, it's not centered around Christ and it's not centered around the truth of God's word. But in order to satisfy the hearers, in order to get people to keep coming back every week is this positive message from the pastor just presenting his own ideas. And here's what ha happens oftentimes. In order to stay or remain so-called relevant with the culture, churches actually die in the process. So it's kind of ironic. They want to change the message in order to keep up with the times, but changing the message is what ultimately kills the church. Churches are seeing this all over. Denominations are seeing this all over. The Bible is no longer seen as sufficient. The message of the gospel is no longer seen as sufficient. So they change the message and it kills the church. The other thing that I would advocate that kills churches is not because they have moved on from the message, but because they have moved on from the mission. They've moved on from doing and being obedient to what Jesus has called them to do. 
and no longer than looking at the needs to the city and the community around them, they become internally focused and they plan events that keep them happy and keep them entertained and they focused on the inner workings of the church, no longer focused on the mission and as churches do that, churches die. Churches die. Maybe you've heard of churches that are full of fighting and full of drama. Ever heard of a church that's full of drama and full of fighting? I would advocate to you that it's not the drama and the conflict that kills them. What kills them is that they have taken their eyes off the mission. They have become a place where disobedient people can gather together and focus on themselves. They've drifted from the mission. And these two things, brothers and sisters, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, changing the message and drifting from the mission is killing churches. It is. And you might be wondering, why in the world are we asking this this morning? Why would I start off this way? And I'm glad that you asked. I'll start off this morning this way because the church of Galatia, these brothers and sisters are in crisis of having drifted away from the message of the gospel. They are drifting away from this message. These brothers and sisters were a part of these regions. You can see this in Acts chapter 13 and 14. In places like Iconium, in places like Lystra, places like Derby, Antioch of Pisidia, these places were, were unevangelized and unengaged with the gospel until a man by the name of Paul came and, as an apostle of Christ, came and preached the message of Jesus. And here's what had happened. Many of these people believed in the message of the gospel. And they gave their lives to Christ. But after Paul left and went on to these other regions and went on to plant churches in other areas, these so-called infiltrators, these influencers, crept into the churches. And they started preaching this message that it was no longer about faith in Christ that was sufficient for salvation, but that it was faith in Christ plus following the ways of the law. It was following Jesus and, and being a follower of him, but they were telling and preaching that you needed to fulfill every piece of the Old Testament law. And this church was believing it. And the church was leaving this message of, of faith and of grace. And they were adding to the message of the gospel. And so this letter to the church at Galatia, this is one of the very first churches that would have ever been planted outside of Jerusalem. Paul writes this letter to the church at Galatia and says this, you are in grave danger. You are in grave danger. Return to the message of the gospel. Come back to Christ. Remember what you once believed in. We're going to see this morning how this is pertinent to us. And what we're going to look at this morning is we're going to look at marks of the message. What is the message of the gospel? What is the message that these churches believed in in the first place? And we're also going to look at what are some marks of a messenger? What are the marks of someone who carries this message of Christ? The big idea this morning, if you don't take anything else away, is this, is that Christians are changed and called by Christ to preach the message of Christ. Let's say this together. Christians are changed and called by Christ to preach the message of Christ. Thank you. Look with me at verse 1. We're going to look at the marks of the message. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. So you see, it's not just one church, but it's many churches over a broad region. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our, of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished 
that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed." As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. First thing that we see this morning is that a mark of the message is that it is centered on Christ. The message of the gospel is centered on Christ. Paul is reminding the church of Galatia, all the churches here, he is reminding them that it was Jesus who saved them, that it was about the work of Jesus on the cross that was presented to them. It was about them placing their faith and their trust in Jesus. And it was about Christ and his grace towards them that saved them that it was not about anything else, that it was not about the works of the law, that it was not about being good people, but it was simply about believing in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, that this message is Christ-centered. Now, what's happened here is that these churches, again, with these infiltrators, they've come in and they've started preaching this message that it's not just about Christ, That it's about following Jesus, but it's also about these works and these things that you can do and what you can bring to the table. But Paul says this, and he lays out his case. He says in verse 4, this Jesus, he says that this Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. He says this about Jesus in verse 6. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. You guys know this, hopefully, that our salvation is based on Christ's work and our faith in Christ. And those are the things that cover us for all of life, that it is by grace through faith that we have in Jesus. That it's not about us. That it's not about what we bring to the table. It is by grace through faith. And you guys know what grace means this morning. You guys know what grace means? What is grace? We sing about it all the time, don't we? Grace is when you get something that you don't deserve. Grace is when you get something that you haven't earned. I don't know many of you parents out there, if you face this, but a lot of times we face this in my household, where my kids, every single night, they want a snack after dinner, or they want dessert after dinner. Never fails. Every night, they want dessert or they want a snack. And generally, we would say to our kids, you did not eat your dinner, therefore you do not get dessert. You did not eat your dinner, therefore you do not get a snack. Sometimes when they will come up to us with their sweet little faces, especially Maddie, and she says, nah, nah, nah. It's so hard in that moment to tell her no. And so a lot of times what happens is we say to them, you're going to get grace. Because you didn't eat your dinner, you didn't do what you were told, you haven't earned this dessert, you haven't earned this snack, but we're going to show you grace in this moment. We learned this from the Tylers. Great job. (laughs) We show them grace. You didn't earn it. There was nothing that you brought to the table. As a matter of fact, you were disqualified from this. You don't deserve this, but we're going to give it to you anyway. And nine times out of 10, they know that if they ask their mama, she's going to show grace. She's going to give them grace. Brothers and sisters, do we see that as it pertains to our relationship with Christ, there's nothing that we have done. There's nothing that we brought to the table for this relationship. 
We didn't bring all of our works. We didn't bring all of our goodness. And Jesus look at us and say, yeah, you've done enough. I think I'll let you in. He is not happy with you because of your goodness, but oh, he is happy with you because of your faith and the work that Christ did. It's not about what you do. It's not about what you have done. It's not even about what you will do in the future. It's all about what he did. And we are covered by this grace this morning. I want you to understand this. Listen, if you think that in some way you being here this morning and attending church is going to help you and make God happy with you, that's not how this works. If you think that in some way being a good person and having all of this list of credible things that you do and giving to charity and being kind to others, if you think that that somehow is going to make God happy with you, I'm sad to tell you that that is not how it works. God tells us plainly from his word that the way that this works is not about what we do, but it is about believing in what he did. God is perfectly satisfied with the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross and by defeating the grave. He is perfectly satisfied with those things. And all that he asks us to do is to believe in his work, to believe in him. It is Jesus plus nothing. It is Jesus plus nothing. He is happy with you because of what Jesus did. This morning, What are you resting in for your salvation? What are you resting in in this relationship with God? Whenever I ask you about your relationship with God and and how it started in the first place, do you think about what Jesus did and your faith in that? Or do you think about a laundry list of things that you've accomplished? It is all about Him. If you are leaning on your work, I'm sorry to tell you that you're leaning on faulty ground. It is insufficient for what is required. Faith in Christ's work is what is required. The mark of the message is that it is all about Christ. Look with me at verse 11. Paul says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Second thing I want us to see this morning is a mark of the message is that it is received by Christ. It is received by Christ. Because Paul had come in and preached the gospel and they began to desert this message of the gospel, they started to see Paul as an inferior messenger. They said, Paul didn't tell us the whole truth. Therefore, we're going to abandon Paul. We're going to listen to what he says. And so Paul is sort of defending his case. Let me tell you why you ought to believe me. And Paul starts off by saying this. He says that you ought to believe me in the message that I preach to you because this message is not from man, but this message was received by me directly from Jesus Christ himself. Paul says, you can hear it, from the horse's mouth, right? You can hear it from the man. I heard it plainly from Jesus, and now I'm declaring to you the message of the gospel, and you can believe that this is truth. It has come straight from Christ. I don't know if you know this or not, but there are many religions around the world that are founded by men. Buddha was a man who taught a whole lot of things. Gandhi was a man who portrayed and characterized thousands upon thousands of God, a man with a message. Joseph Smith was a man here on the earth with a message. Muhammad was a man with a message. But we have the assurance that our message does not come from man. Our message comes from God himself. And I don't know if you know this or not, but God is still revealing himself and calling us. And the message that we have, we have received from Christ. Two main ways that Christ reveals himself to us today. One of them is through his spirit. Christ is still revealing himself to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. You guys know this. 
that one of the jobs, the main job of the Holy Spirit, his work in your life is to point you to Jesus. That's one of the things that the Holy Spirit does. The main thing that the Holy Spirit does is to point you to Jesus. That's why I get lost a lot of times whenever people talk about the work of the Holy Spirit that has nothing to do with Jesus. That's not why he came. He came to teach us and to lead us to Christ. He has given us his spirit to teach us. But the second way, and we have this, it is not the spirit of Christ, but it is the spirit of Christ teaching us about Christ through the word of God. We have this as a way that God has revealed himself and the person of Christ to us through his word. You guys know that this morning. Are you excited about that? That God has revealed himself to us through his word. And we don't have to guess and wonder, is this true? Can I believe it? Is this real? Can I give my life to this? Yes, you absolutely can. Because it has come. It has come from the one. Paul says, I'm not the man, but I know the man. And this is what Jesus has done. He has given us his spirit and his word so that we can know. 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16 says this, says all scripture is breathed out by God. We know that. The verse before that says this, these sacred writings are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I remember whenever I was nine years old, I was just a little boy nine years old. And when I was nine years old, I was shocked you with some of this. The year 2000 was coming up. We didn't know what was going to happen, right? We didn't thought the world was going to end. So I had heard this message of Christ all my life. Up until this point, I said, I got to give it to him. I got to believe in this Jesus, especially if the computers are crashed and everything happens. I need to be on the right side with Jesus. So I followed him. I was baptized. And I believe that it was genuine, but I didn't understand it. I'm just going to be honest with you. I didn't understand all the inner workings. Thankfully, God knew what he was doing, even though I didn't at the time. But I remember vividly, whenever I was 16 years old, I was 16 years old when the Spirit of God just gripped my heart. I was 16, and you can understand, at that point in time in life, you've got friends that are going their own way, making their own decisions, and there I was at 16. I didn't know. I wasn't sure. Am I, am I going to go with this crowd? I'm going to do the things that they're doing? Is this the path that my life is going to take? Or am I going to stay on this path following Jesus? And I remember I was in students one night. We were singing these worship songs, and I don't exactly remember what was happening, but at the crux of that moment and time in my life, I remember thinking, I've got to put my yes on the table with Jesus. And I remember as we were singing these worship songs during student ministry, that's why it's so important, we were singing these songs, and I, I know that it was the Holy Spirit just gripping my heart, saying to me that even if all of your friends abandon you, you still have Christ. Are you in or not? And I remember at 16, put my yes on the table. Then again at 19, 19 years old, I went off to college for the very first time, and I didn't know what an agnostic was, but I found out the first day of college. I didn't know what a, a professor who was of the world, like teaching things that were of the I had no idea, but I found out on the first day, and I remember being so perplexed, and again, at a crossroads, what am I going to do? Like, who am I? And I remember that it was the Word of God the Holy Spirit using the Word of God to teach me about Christ that held my feet firmly on a foundation. This message is received by Christ. It is received by Him, and we know this to be true. Brothers and sisters, do you remember when you received the message of Christ? Do you remember when it became so plainly to you, either through the Spirit of God or the Word of God, about what Jesus had done for you? Do you remember that moment when you knew that what you, believe, what you were believing in was true? You can believe this, that this story of salvation, this message of salvation did not come from man, but it came from Christ. Your story has credibility, not because of you, but because of the author of your salvation. We have received this message by Christ. Let's look again. 
We're going to look at the marks of the messenger. The marks of the messenger. Start with me in verse 13. He says, For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. Let's stop right there. One of the marks of the messengers that I want you to see this morning, one of the marks of the messengers is that a messenger has been called by Christ. A messenger has been called by Christ. Do you guys see this moment? instantaneously, Paul went from being someone who persecuted the church and hated Christians to in a split second being saved by God to being a messenger for the gospel. In a split second, in a, mom in a, a momentary second, he had gone from being a persecutor of the church to being someone who preached the message of the gospel. And we know this, that Paul has given up his life. He has given up his life to be a messenger for Christ. I want you to understand this. I want you to lock in with me for just a second. We all have different assignments. We've all been called to different people. We've all been called to different places but we have all received the same calling. Your assignment might be different from mine. I don't have the same neighbors that you have. I don't have the same co-workers that you have. My assignment is different, but we all have the same calling. It is to make disciples wherever we go. 2 Corinthians 5 says that we were once in the flesh, but after having been saved... We no longer view people through the lens of the flesh, but we are now ambassadors for Christ. We are now ministers of reconciliation in a, moment, in, a, in a momentary second, in a matter of moments. We have gone from being dead in, in the flesh to now being saved and ministers of this message. Ephesians 2 says the same thing, that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We have been saved by grace, and now we have been created for good works. In a matter of seconds, finally got it out that time. In a matter of seconds, we have been made new, and we have been made into messengers for Christ. Many of you have heard this story about Pastor Eddie. Pastor Eddie was a missionary in Indonesia. He was in a part of the country that was incredibly dense with a lot of radical Muslims, a lot of radical Muslims there in his village of Indonesia. And Pastor Eddie had built a relationship with his barber. It's a good place to share, right? It's a good place to be a messenger. You've got a pretty captive audience. You can tell them anything. And generally, they're looking to talk, let the day, let the day pass by much faster. He had built this relationship with this Muslim barber. And one day as he was cutting his hair, the barber stopped what he was doing and he went over to the blinds and he closed the blinds. Pastor Eddie's getting a little nervous at this point in time. The barber walks over to the door and he puts a closed sign on the door. He's getting really nervous at this point. Starts thinking to himself, they're going to bring out a, a blindfold. I'm headed to the guillotine. They've got me. It's over. The barber walks back to Pastor Eddie. Before he begins cutting his hair again, he says to him, he says, I've got to know about this Jesus. He says, I see your life. I know that you're different. You've got to tell me what you have because I see something different in you from everybody else in my life, from everybody else that I see. You've got to tell me about this Jesus. And many of us, we would jump at this opportunity, right? We would jump at this opportunity. We'd walk them through the plan of salvation. We would share with them our testimony or, or we would jump into the ABCs of salvation. And maybe we should. But Pastor Eddie, for whatever reason in that moment, he didn't, he didn't start off by sharing with them a, a list of things. He, 
He made one thing very clear. He says, I'm going to share with you the message of salvation, and I want you to believe in this, but I need you to understand this, that from now on, from this moment forth, every person, every customer who sits in this chair, you are now responsible for their lives and making sure that they hear this message that I'm about to share with you. Do you still want it? Do you still want to hear it? good, bad, right, or wrong, this is somebody who understands their calling. Paul understood his calling. He says, whenever I had been set apart before I was born, he who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. Why? In order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. In order that I might preach Christ. Being a disciple means that you are actively engaging people with the message of the gospel. Let me say that again. Being a disciple means that you are actively engaging people with the gospel. You have been called to this. Do you know the hurts, the hobbies, the hang-ups of the people that are closest around you? Do you know the brokenness of the lives that is around you. Do you know their stories? And some of you might be thinking this morning, well, you don't want me sharing my story. Do you know who I am? Do you know what I've been through? Do you know what I've done? There's no way that I could possibly share my story and share the message of hope with those that are in darkness. I got good news for you. Guess what? Whenever you share the gospel and you go as an ambassador, you're not representing yourself. If you were representing yourself, yeah, maybe you'd have a whole lot of mess in the presentation. But you're not representing you. You are an ambassador for someone who is much greater. You don't represent your own brokenness, but you represent the purity and the perfection of Christ. We represent his peace to those that are around us. I want you to do something with me for just a moment. I want you to look with me at verse 15. Verse 15 says this, but when he who had set me apart before I was born, who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son too, says me, but I want you to insert your name there. He was pleased to reveal his son to David. He was pleased to reveal his son to Ashley. He was pleased to reveal his son to Jake. He was pleased to reveal his son to Alex. Insert your name there. In order that I might preach him among... I want you to insert your lost friend. I want you to insert your lost neighbor. Insert your lost coworker. Insert somebody in your life you know that is in the midst of brokenness and darkness. And I want you to understand this. He was pleased to reveal himself to you so that you might now preach the gospel. Do not let the mission stop with you. Carry on the mission wherever you go. Let's look at verse 16 or 17. He says that I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were the apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and I returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, also known as Peter, and I remained with him for 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. And what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. The last thing that I want us to see this morning is that the messenger is changed by Christ. The messenger is called by Christ and the messenger has been changed by Christ. This Paul that we have just read about says that he was persecuting the faith. He was literally receiving letters 
so that the church members could be found out in prison and ultimately put to death. This Paul would be about like, you can think through, any modern day extreme terrorist organization that hates us. Any modern day terrorist organization that hates you, Paul would have been one of the guys at the top. And radically, in a moment, Jesus came into his life and changed him. He changed his life and moved him to the point where he was now preaching the message of faith that he had once tried to destroy. These people in these churches, you better believe that they had heard about this Paul. They had heard about his testimony. And brothers and sisters, this is the power of a changed life. Whatever the king touches, he changes. Does your life look differently today after having placed your faith in Jesus than it did than years prior? Does your life look different? Have you been changed from the inside out? Has he changed your manner of thinking? Has he changed your manner of speaking? Has he changed your heart? Because this is the mark of the messenger is that he's changed you. That you're no longer the same person. No longer desiring those same things. At least at the level you used to. Paul was radically changed by the gospel. There was a rapper just a few years ago. And by rapper, I mean literal rapper. He was one of the most infamous rappers of our time. I'm not going to tell you his name. I'll give you a clue. Uh, he wrote a whole album in which the most famous song had to do with Chick-fil-A. Uh, it was reported that this rapper came to faith in Jesus and everybody from the outside was looking and they were watching. Some of them were hoping that it was real. Some of them were hoping that it was genuine. Others just said, I don't see how it could be real. Two years later, let's just say that this person does not exemplify the character of someone who has placed their faith in Jesus. And two years later, although they said that there was a change, we don't see much of a change. What about you? What about your story? Has your life been radically changed by the gospel? Has your life been made radically new because of Christ's work in your life? Because this is what he wants to do. This is what he wants to do. He wants to change you. He wants to call you into this new ministry and being on mission with him. These are the marks of the message that it is centered on Christ and it is received by Christ, that it is received by him. I want to ask you just a couple questions based on this this morning. The first question I want to ask you is this. Do you know what you believe? Do you know what you believe? Do you know the doctrine and the theology that the Bible teaches this morning? Have you a firm grip on your doctrine? We see this morning from the churches that were in Galatia how easy it is to be swept by new teaching. We see how easy it is to be misled by false doctrine. And I just want to tell you this morning that false doctrine kills churches. It kills churches, destroys denominations. Do you know this morning what you believe for your convenience? We have it right there on our website, on the first page of our website, under About Us. You can go and see everything that Creekside Church believes in our statement of belief. Listen, I want you to know what we believe. I want you to know what we stand on. I want you to be solid in it. Because a day is coming, a time is coming when it will be key, it will be critical for you to know what you believe. The day is coming when this may no longer be. The day is coming when this may no longer be as accessible as it is. And you know this, you believe this. Do we know what we believe for when the time comes so that we will not be blown to and fro by the winds of change. 
Bad theology kills churches. This morning, we've also printed off a copy of our statement of beliefs, and I believe that I still have just a few of those copies left. If you want a physical copy of that, you can see it. Take it home with you. Look at all of our statement of beliefs. Know who we are. Be comfortable. Ask questions. First question was, do you know what you believe? The second question is this, do you bear the marks of a messenger? Do you bear the marks of a messenger? Does our church follow Christ into the mission? Have we followed Christ into the mission? Has he changed us from the inside out? Has he called us and do we realize our calling this morning? Or have we chosen to sit on the sidelines and watch as others pursue the mission? Are we looking at Paul and saying, this is for him to fulfill, but this is not my purpose? Have we chosen to say that this is not what Christ has called me to? Listen, we have been changed and we have been called by Christ to bear his name. And the life of this church, the life of any church, has no bearing about the money has no bearing about a building. The bearing of the life and the vitality of any church pertains wholly on what they believe and what they choose to do with the mission. If we want to see this as a healthy church, if we want to see this as a a church that has vitality and life, then we will choose to be on mission. But failure to do so will mean that we are in peril of losing everything. Churches that refuse to be on mission, they die. Christ will not allow the doors to stay open to those churches who think only about themselves. And many, sadly, are seeing this happen. We don't want this to be our story. We're not going to let this be our story, are we? If you would, this morning, I want us to all just take a moment, just right where you are, with every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to ask this question of you. Has there ever been a moment in your life where you knew where Christ was calling you into relationship with him and where you believed by grace through faith in that message? Would you raise your hand this morning if you can remember that moment? You remember that moment this morning? When Jesus called you into relationship for the very first time. For some of you, maybe this this morning, you would look back and you would say, I I don't ever remember that moment where I put my yes on the table. I I don't remember that moment at all when I believed in Jesus whenever I gave him my life. If you're here this morning and you... You don't know of a time where you believed in Jesus and you don't know if you have a relationship with him. Would you raise your hand this morning? Thank you. This morning, how about this? How about your calling? Do you understand your calling? Do you see your calling? Has God reminded you this morning that you've got somebody in your life that's walking through brokenness, that's walking through heartache, and he has equipped you, he has called you to be a messenger for them? Have you been obedient with that? Have you done what he's asked you to do? Have you done what he's called you to do? He has changed you. He has called you to preach his message. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. And God, we just want to thank you for this message, that it is Jesus plus nothing, that it is not about anything that we've accomplished in the past, that it's not about anything that we can accomplish in the future, that it is only by faith in believing in the message of Christ, by believing in his death, burial, and resurrection. God, I'm grateful this morning that it's nothing about my past that disqualifies me, that it's nothing about what happens ever in my future that would disqualify me, that it's only through your grace that it has been extended to me. God, we pray this morning that we be not like the church in Galatia, that we'd be tossed to and fro, believing in another message, believing in something else for our salvation. 
Lord, let us believe this. Lord, for some of us this morning, we do not have a relationship with Jesus. We've never believed in the message of the gospel, and today is the day of salvation. Lord, would you call those in who are without relationship with Christ? God, we pray that we would be sent from this place as messengers looking for those who do not have relationship. Lord, that we have been called and we've been changed by the gospel, not to keep it to ourselves, but to share it with many, many others. God, we will leave this place today changed, having done whatever it is that you've called us to do, having believed in whatever it is that you've called us to believe. And we will ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, if you raised your hand just a moment ago and you would admit this morning that you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you can't remember that time, I'm going to be at room five this morning. I'll be there for anybody who would like to talk or to pray to know more about this relationship with Christ. We pray that you would be obedient to whatever it is the Lord's calling you to today. Would you guys stand with us as we close? Praise forever. 
King of Kings. We praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the pray. God, we thank you so much for the chance to gather together today, to be together as a church family and to sing together and to hear from your word. Lord, we thank you for Galatians 1 and for the challenge, Lord, to evaluate ourselves, to know what we believe, Lord, and to be people who are marked like those who are messengers, Lord. Would you give us boldness this week, um, to be unashamed to share the gospel with those around us, Lord? Would you help us to um, just exemplify your love and your grace and your truth to those around us? And may they see the hope that we have in you and, and ask us, Lord, and give us the words to say, Lord, we thank you so much for the cross and for salvation, Lord, and for the hope that we have in you, Lord. We love you, and we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Thanks for coming. Y'all have a great week.